everyone. Welcome to Virtual AWP and Conversations with Writers. I'm Regina Brooks with AWP Board of Directors. And today I'm talking to novelist Maurice Carlos Ruffin, author of We Cast a Shadow. Glad Hello, to be here. Maurice. How are you? I am uh, blessed and highly favored. I'm very happy to be a part of this. Yeah, so excited. I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time. So I'm going to just dive right in because, you know, even though it's an hour, it can go really, really fast. So I'm going to start by saying for over a decade as an agent, I participated in a course that exposed and taught lawyers how to get their books published. What you, what helped you the most in making the transition from a commercial litigator and trial attorney to literary novelist, especially as one whose debut was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award. I'm telling you, that's no easy feat. <laughs> that's such a great question, too, because nobody's ever asked me that. Um, yes, I, I was a corporate lawyer for 15 years, give or take. And the transition, I think it required being strategic because one of the things you don't have a lot of when you're a corporate lawyer is spare time. Um, and so you have to find ways to make time to write first and foremost to get the job done. And secondly, you gotta find a way to sort of reveal your reserves. It takes a lot of energy to be um, a corporate lawyer. So what I came to understand over time was that um, I enjoyed writing so much that if I approached it a certain way, I recognized that I really loved it, I wouldn't feel worn out by writing. So, you know, a lot of writers complain about, oh, you know, I wrote and it was terrible and I couldn't stand it. And I just figured out that if I really wrote in a way that was joyful to me, if I enjoyed it, yeah. um, I would always have more power left over. So, you know, and then also on the strategy portion of it, you know, thinking about how to find a good agent, how to find a good publisher, um, you know, how to, uh, when the time came, market the book, all those things were like, like not to belittle it, but it was, it was like a game for me. And I, I liked sort of figuring out how to make this thing work. And of course, you know, all successful artists and entrepreneurs, they have these things where you hit like their backstory, you know, right. like Matt now selling CDs in his trunk and then, you know, making this great deal for himself. I really took inspiration from those kinds of stories where it was like, don't be afraid to think unconventionally. Don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't be afraid to follow that mission wherever it leads you. And when it came down to it, I wrote the book I wanted to write. And I think more than anything else, that's what made the book, um, interesting and pleasurable to so many uh, readers, including, you know, agents and, and editors as well. It's funny because we're, we're, we're working with so many attorneys and a lot of attorneys really were English majors first mm -hmm. and they went to law school because they wanted to make, quote, money. <laughs> so was that you too? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Hundred percent. My wife was going to uh, was going to law school. I'm like, wait, I can't have her making way more money than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, interestingly enough, your novel opens with a surreal law office party hazing ceremony, and it features the humiliation of black lawyers competing from a for a promotion, and plays with several tropes. The pill popping first person narr narrator starts dressed as a Roman centurion and is urged by his white superior to wear a Zulu king costume, complete with loin claw, which he accidentally drops and exposes himself. Um, and another black lawyer is dressed as a waiter and another as a prison inmate. It's kind of a twisted performance of blackness for the white pipe party goers who place bets on who will win. Is this a conscious nod to the harrowing opening chapter of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, where young black men are also humiliated for the amusement of white spectators? Oh yeah, 100%. I can literally recall when I decided to do that. First of all, I have always loved um, Ellison's Invisible Man. That book for me was formative. And the reason why I love it so much is because I think that even though it was written you know, like 80 years ago now, he, he was, very much speaking to the black experience in a way that felt very honest to me. So, um, you know, that idea of performance that so many black men and women have to put on to be in this society that America is, is a common thing. It's not that unusual at all. We do it often every day of our lives. Um, right. So, you know, it's funny, like, even after the book came out, I saw um, Sorry to Body, directed by Boots Riley. And there's, oh, yeah. there's that one scene where the main character goes to the mansion where the guy, his last name was Lip, but he's like a mogul, sort of like a Mark Zuckerberg type or whatever. And, you know, there's a bunch of white people at this party and they put on some hip hop. And then 
the 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 boss guy asks the main character to go up there and like spit some bars and rap, you know, for the audience. Of course, he's not a rapper. That's the first thing about it. But they make these assumptions about who he is, and so you know that's just very much a part of of so much of our experience and how a person reacts to that is very much a part of, of, you know, where you are in a given moment. Are you fed up? Do you want to fight back? Do you just want to leave the room? Um, or will you play along because there's a momentary gain from it? I think that, you know, my narrator as well as the unnamed narrator in Invisible Man are both experiencing that in the moment. Yeah. I mean, in some ways I feel like there's a dialogue with Invisible Man and, um, you gave another example with the play. Um, okay, the theme of skydiving into whiteness runs throughout your novel. The unnamed narrator insists on using burning skin bleaching cream on his son, Nigel, and injecting him with chemicals that will scrub his blackness. A Nigerian doctor performs procedures for thinning nose, noses and lips, and even one for bleaching the entire body with an unforgettable name, the Spotless Special. <laughs> um, what is the most, what is it that most drew you to explore the painful subjects of self-hatred and colorism with satire? Yeah, I mean, I think, I can't think of anything that is sadder than self-hatred. And, you know, I'm not my narrator, you know, I love being a black man. You know, I, I love my family, my mother, my wife, all my friends. But whenever I would encounter somebody who had that sort of self-hating spirit, I just was very disturbed by it. And I think that um, I came to understand that it wasn't just an American problem, but it's really a, a worldwide problem. Yes. Um, you know, in my sort of research, I, I would see that in Korea, people were using skin uh, bleaching creams. Of course, in Africa, which I think is part of the reason why I made Dr. Nzinga from Nigeria. Right. And then, you know, you sort of recognize that when you're paying attention and you're seeing how how these things are uh, so present in our society, um, it never goes away. So for example, just two months ago, after um, George Floyd was um, was murdered, I saw that this French company, I think it's Unilever perhaps, who makes a, a product called Fair and Lovely, which is very popular in India. So they decided that their big move in this moment was, gonna, was to change the name from Fair and Lovely to just Lovely, right? Now uh, they're still producing this product that is designed to destroy melanin, and, and uh, you know, just feeding the people's sort of fears about being dark-skinned in the world. Um, but I just yeah, think that... I have to yeah. something about that because there have been companies, and you mentioned one, that are trying to kind of either remove the bleaching creams from their um, product line or change their names. So, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's Absolutely. very interesting. Yeah, and it's so funny that they just kind of now are recognizing that. Well, I mean, the thing about it is they always knew to, I mean, look, they make the product. They know what it's for. You know, any company, particularly like a mega international, multi-international corporation knows who their customers are and knows how their product is being used. You know, it's kind of like when you buy Q-tips in the store and it always says, don't put in your ear canal. Right. Most people are putting those things in ear canals and they know that. That's like a liability issue. And so it's not as if they had some big epiphany in these various companies. They just felt some pressure. And they wanted to make a move to sort of stave off the ultimate change. I mean, I think that at some point, you know, these kinds of products, which are often very harmful. I mean, I think that, um, in a lot of countries, they feature like mercury and lead, in them, which are banned in America. So they're going to go away eventually. So they're just trying to like avoid their own obsolescence, which to me is only a matter of time, particularly, you know, as hopefully we as a species move away from hatred of dark skin and towards this recognition of the shared humanity and beauty in you know, brown and black skin. Hmm. That was a pretty impressive answer. Can you talk about Nigel's birth? Um, it felt like a symbol for the blackness that refuses to be erased and contained. And that continues to be morphed until it finally is released. And it also made me think of Hawthorne's short story, The Birthmark. I don't know if you remember that. And of the birth and of the birthmark um, for Toni Morrison's Sula. I did it. Okay, good. <laughs> were, there either, were either of those works or others an influence? Well, first of all, I'm going to put what you said, like on the, on the jacket of like the reprint, that idea of the Black Sarah Free Speak contained. I hadn't thought about that, but 100%, 100%. You know, Nigel, the son of the narrator, is one of my favorite characters in the book because he really is 
fighting this struggle in a very individual sense um, against racism. You know, he is an anti-racist, you know, as Dr. Ibram Kennedy would say today. So um, certainly for me, you know, both Toni Morrison and Sula, and Sula's my favorite book of hers, um, I just love it so much because of what it says about anti-blackness, but even more so about, about um, misogyny, about how people look at black women and how black women move to the world. So that's a big part of that book. And of course, in Hawthorne's story, which I read like in college, and it kind of went over my head at first. Um, yeah. So I read it in grad school, and I was like, this is incredible. You have this character who's basically like a Steve Jobs figure in the 1850s. He can invent anything he wants to invent. He meets this beautiful young lady, but she has a birthmark. He wants to get rid of it. And so this whole thing unfolds. And so, you know, in, in, in that story, very directly, but then also in Toni Morrison's story, one of the characters has a birthmark also. And it sort of is perceived differently by whoever's looking at the character with the birthmark. And so I just kept thinking, I could do so much with that. As well as a whole yeah. um, Scarlet Letter, where the baby that Hester Prince has out of wedlock, Pearl, is kind of a metaphoric character. Depending on who's looking at Pearl, she's thinking different things. So I just kept saying, you know, that smells really good. I want how it tastes. Um, let's see. Despite the, des the narrator's desire to literally erase Nigel's blackness and a paternal love deformed by racism, he also feels great tenderness for his son. He wants him to not live a life of diminished opportunity. Um, this metaphor kind of haunted me. The world is a centrifuge that patiently waits for, waits to separate my um, my Nigel from his basic human dignity. Okay, so the narrator's relationship with his father, who was wrongly incarcerated and broken by the criminal justice system, is kind of complicated. Can you say more about the father and the son's relationship in your novel? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, you know, the problem with white supremacy is that it's designed to destroy and degrade. I mean, this entire purpose is to cause as much pain as possible uh, on behalf of white supremacy. And so I think one of the saddest things in the book is this idea of fatherhood and how it plays out over generations. I mean, there's the grandfather who's like 99 years old in the flashback. There's never his own father. There's the narrator himself who has a son. And very much all of their relationships with their sons are affected by white supremacy. And so I think that I wanted to show how each of the different, these men and, and boys reacted to what happened with their fathers. And I think for the narrator, what is so sad is he basically bought into so much of the propaganda about black fathers in particular. I mean, you know, this whole narrative that black men are terrible fathers, that black men are um, absent fathers, you know, I just always think, well, okay, what strategies and policies led to some of what we see today? First of all, I don't believe it, first of all. But secondly, they, you know, it's true that a lot of black men have been incarcerated. What was happening? I mean, you go back to the 80s, you have America um, it, you know, exporting guns you know, to Latin America, in return, taking drugs back, putting those drugs into the black communities, flooding the black communities, then arresting the young black men who are selling the drugs because there's no opportunities in these uh, decimated post-industrial cities. You put the black men in jail, and some black women as well, you build these gigantic prisons, you make them private, and then you have um, a lot of white guys getting rich off of private prisons. You have a lot of people in rural areas who, yeah. you know, where there were factories and other things, that's their only way of make, make, making money by going to the prison and working as a security guard or somebody who's one of the staff members. And so I saw a very, a very deliberate process that developed over years to create this, to actually basically like back up the stereotype because the stereotype came first, I think, this idea that black parents and black fathers in particular were not good parents. And they just sort of figured out ways to make it true. In the same way, you know, the, the Reagan stereotype about the um, welfare queen. There was like one lady in like New Jersey doing some weird things, but there are a lot of welfare frauds throughout the entire world, let alone throughout America. And so he overplays it. Reagan says that, yes, this is obviously what all these black ladies are doing when it's a total lie. And so then you begin to, you know, cut benefits or make it so hard to actually access the benefits that people actually have to, like, say things that are not true to access the benefits. So, so I'm just saying that it, it, the idea that this character saw his father, how he sees him as basically like a loser who made a, made a series of mistakes, is one more thing that's designed to oppress black people, men, women, children, girls, you name it. Hmm. So the narrator, 
ingratiates himself with a civil rights organization called Blind Equity, I mean, Blind, Blind Equality Group, or BEG. <laughs> the acronym made me laugh and went because of the irony, right? Um, he's trying to prove his blackness to get a promotion that will pay him for the removal of his son's blackness. And so in a fiery speech, the narrator says, it's time to clean up the vestiges of the caste system based on the color of your skin. Have you read Isabella's, um, Isabella Wilkerson's recent book, Cast? Um, it sure has made an impression on many. And you know how Oprah just, I mean, she just has totally gotten behind this book and um, she's been buying it and giving it away to top business executives. What do you think of her argument that the U.S. is an example of a caste system where race is the market and comparable to the treatment of the untouchables or the Dalits in India and the Jews in Nazi Germany? Oh, yeah. Well, look, I mean, the thing is, first of all, Isabella Wilkinson is one of the greatest writers of our age. Um, to me, that's undeniable. And, uh, you know, her book, uh, Warmth of Other Sons, is just such an epic and loving telling of the movement of Black folks from the South to the North to escape the worst parts of white supremacy. Um, you know, the idea of a caste system that I, I put into my book, I haven't read her, her new book yet. It just came out like last week. So. Okay, yeah, it's new. But, but I will tell you that, I mean, she's such a brilliant writer that even in her talking about it, like I've heard her uh, give interviews and such, you know, she just breaks it down so clean. Now, I think she would even admit that she's not the first person to compare um, racism in America to a caste system. And I put it in my book, and I'm not the first person that also used that idea. And like you just mentioned, I very much was looking at different parts in the world, like, you know, the Dalits and other places or people around the world who you could see that their society had decided we're going to have various classes. Maybe it's two classes, maybe it's five classes, maybe it's like the um, Spanish had colonial days with like, you know, 35 classes based on the exact color of your skin and who your parents were. But I think with America, there's no doubt in my mind this is a caste system. And the reason why I say that is because people often make this argument, I mean, particularly white people, where they'll say, I'm not a racist. And I love the fact that I mentioned his name before, Dr. Kendi, with his book, you know, how to be an anti-racist has been saying, well, not being racist is not enough. Get the anti-racist. And his idea, in my mind, connects to uh, Ms. Wilkerson's idea. The reason why being, in, being um, you know, not racist is not sufficient is because in the American caste system, we have decided that if you're a certain color of skin, you're automatically not to be accepted as a part of the upper echelon of society. You're not educated. You're not smart. You shouldn't be wealthy. And so people are surprised when you achieve things. And so, you know, I heard just like a random interview. Um, th th there's this gentleman, he is, um, he's now the head of the Air Force. As of like this week, he's the first black man to head that, um, that particular branch of the military. And he said as a young pilot, because he was an actual F-16 pilot, so it was a big deal. He walked into like the locker room with the other pilots. Imagine like Top Gun with, you know, uh, right. Tom Cruise and, you know, uh, you know, Goose and those guys, right? He walks in there and he's wearing his flight suit, which is like the sort of identifier of being a pilot in the Air Force. And those white guys in his squad looked at him and said, wait, are you a pilot? Or like, you're here to clean up. And they weren't even joking. And the point is, because the color of our skin is designed to brand us and put us in certain places, they, they could easily say, oh, yeah, he doesn't really belong here. And so I just think so much about how, how that is a part of who we are. And I have to give credit also to a very old book that I read. In fact, so I'm in, I'm in Oxford right now. I just moved here for, um, to get a Grisham writer in residence. And when I first came here about seven years ago, I went to Square Books, and there was a book on the shelf called The Slave Power, an intriguing title, title The Slave Power, written in 1861 by an Irish economic scholar, like a professor from the university. He comes over here, takes a tour of the entire South from Virginia to New Orleans, and he's a very smart guy, and he's looking at how the war is going to break out pretty soon, the Civil War. And he says, you know, I've studied like slavery throughout history, the Greeks, a little bit in Ireland, other places throughout the world, but I had never known it was possible to basically link the idea of slavery to a race of people based on some particular physical feature. And he said in 1861 that because that linkage, that branding like a like Coca-Cola or at and or, or Facebook, that branding was so powerful, he imagined it would last for at least 100 more years, even if the North beat the South in the Civil War. And here we are 170 years later, of 60 years later, he was right about that. He was all pointing because that brand has made to today. 
Wow. I mean, when you talked about the pilot um, um, situation, I actually can relate to that because I'm a pilot and I have, yeah, and I actually have a plane in Farmingdale um, and we have, I'm I'm part of an organization that I created called Brooklyn Aviation. And every time I go out and try to, you know, get my plane, people look at me kind of like, okay, why are you here? And it's so it's so strange. So I can totally relate what do you to have, that. A Cessna? Yeah, no, I have a Piper. A Piper. Ooh, fancy. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a fun little hobby. I don't get, get a chance to um to take advantage of it as much as I would like to, but um I admire that so much though. I mean, I, I love planes, I love flying. I'm not brave enough to own my own plane and fly. I had a client who used to bring in his plane sometime, a little little like four seater. Um yes. so I really I just love that so much. Well, in this whole environment where it's, you're kind of nervous about getting on planes, if you're going a short distance, it's kind of cool to have your own. <laughs> Who are you telling? That's incredible. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. So the narrator's wife, Penny, is white, a well-intentioned liberal who loves her son unconditionally. However, there's a painful scene where the narrator realizes Penny has never had to hear, quote, the talk given by black parents on how to avoid a victim, how to avoid being a vic- victim of uh, police violence. Uh, she also underestimates this threat to Nigel and also doesn't fully grasp the impact of relentless racism on her own husband. So after the 2016 election, you wrote brilliantly about white naivete and the perception gap in, li- in a lit hub piece called The Effect of White Supremacy are non the effects of white supremacy are non-transferable. Do you think recent protests have changed this perception gap among liberals, or will this moment of wokeness be short-lived? What do you think about how publishers issued statements of solidarity with Black Lives Matter? Oh my goodness, there's a lot in there to unpack. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, look, in my answer, I'm not gonna sound like an optimist, but I am an optimist at heart. Yeah. Um, but I think that the major problem here, it really comes down to, to the idea of education. I love the idea that in this horrible moment when we saw a black man murdered live on camera, George Floyd, okay? And we saw it a few other times. I mean, we got Michael Schlager, we got Richard Brooks, we got Flair Castillo. But in this moment, the entire world turned its face to what happened and said, we got to stop this, okay? That to me is a beautiful thing. But and, and, and so many of us, you know, writers, entertainers, performers, intellectuals, you name us, we're all fighting to get the truth out there. But what, what I fear, though, is that people may be too keyed into this idea of, like, solving this one particular problem, you know, police brutality, right? And even in that case, people don't really have necessarily well-thought-out solutions to this problem. You know, do you defund the police? Do you go to community policing? Do you, do you change the approach of black communities? What do you do? That's a big question there, but I think the thing they're missing, and I think, again, this is what Wilkerson's book is getting towards, is this idea that you have to go to the root cause. You have to look at America and say, why do these things keep on happening? And I think one of the major reasons why these things keep on happening is that we teach our American children that racism is basically a myth, or that it's a thing of the past, or that it's being fixed and repaired and dismantled. And it's the reason why even some of my most well-meaning and intelligent and, and, and lovable white friends like had this idea of, you know, it's getting better, it's getting better, it's getting better, and it's shocked that George Floyd dies. Well, I said, what did you learn in school about all this stuff? And I say, you know, when you were in civics in, I don't know, 10th grade, what were they telling you about American history? And I'll say, well, you know, I mean, look, we had, we had slavery, it was bad, and then we had, you know, Harry Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass, the triumvirate, come in there like, you know, some superheroes fight for a while, <laughs> inspired Lincoln to sort of knock out, um, you know, slavery, and that kind of ended things until we got a little out of, out of sorts during the civil rights movement. We sort of carried that thing to, you know, the sacrifice of Dr. King and Rosa Parks and Malcolm X. But what they don't quite understand is that that's not the, that's, that is not the story. The story, the story is a story that every time, let's just call them the white supremacist side of the equation, loses something, they find a place that something. So you stop slavery. But even in the amendment to, to stop slavery, you put in a provision that says that if you go to jail as a felon, 
you can be used as a slave. It's, it's in the 14th Amendment, it's right there. So, so that's there. Then you say, well, you know, even if you're still free and not a criminal, we have peonage. So that if you were a slave worker on a farm, well, we're not, you're not going like, to be like a, you know, a landowner. Right? You have no money. So we're going to keep you on the farm, turn you into a sharecropper. You can't loiter. They make the loitering laws all around the South, especially that say if you're just caught walking around, you can be incarcerated. So you put all these games. Then you codify it in laws into Jim Crow. Then you take Jim Crow and you say, oh, we're getting rid of that? Well, we're going to have some new things. Let's make some mass incarceration. You know, we're going to have some things where um, technology is invented so that we can have constant surveillance. And so my point is, because those stories are not told in any significant detail, and even the best of high school, even in the most expensive, most lauded universities, I've, I've visited Yale. I know what Harvard is like. If you go around the world, I know what Cambridge is like. They are not teaching those things even in the highest levels of our civilization. And so therefore, you know, you, you can't see the ball, you, you can't hit the ball you can't see. You know, you can't kill the ball that you're not aware of. And so while I applaud people who are going out there and protesting and trying to be anti-racist, if you don't know what you're looking at, you cannot see it. There's an old story, I can't remember where I heard it from, that the first Native Americans to see Columbus's ships coming over the horizon, that the Mayflower, the Penta, and the Santa Maria, when they saw the ships, they actually didn't see anything. They saw a horizon with like birds and clouds and waves because they had never seen a ship that large. And it wasn't until they landed on top of them and the settlers got out that they kind of went, wait, what is this thing? And I just fear that we are so, in some cases, even opposed to having this education in school. You see in conservative states, you can't put that in our textbook for us sixth graders. If we can't solve these problems of knowledge, we can't solve the problems at all. Whew. Yeah, well, like you said, there was a lot to unpack there, and you did it. <laughs> I didn't even get to the part about the letters from the publisher, but that's a whole separate issue. Well, yeah, we can get to that a little bit later, because I have some questions about the publishers in a minute. Um, let's see. Oh, gosh, so much, so much, so much. Okay, so... I want to make sure that, you know, as I'm as I'm having this conversation with you, I'm pulling in some of the things from your book so people can get all excited about wanting to go read it. So um You mean these books so right here? Yes, those books right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um so in your book you write about an attack at a mall related to what we're now calling monument wars. When you were writing it, did you did you could you even imagine? A few years later, we'd see a global movement demanding the removal of, of the statues of the world's most notorious white supremacists, like Belgian's Leopold II and the imperialist Cecil Rhodes. Do you think that attacking these kinds of symbols opens the door to systemic change? Well, I think it's a good starter. Um, when I was writing the book, so I finished writing the book in 16, so it's before a lot of this stuff started. And I don't think I'm psychic, but my mom says it runs in the family because I had an auntie who was a soothsayer. My mom could see some things. I do take some pleasure in the fact that there's so many things in the book, whether, again, it's the fair and lovely with the skin cream, the demelanization. It's brutality against, like, the narrator's father in the book, which is just like George Floyd in some sense, whether it's things like the monuments. You know, I think... I think one of the things about our history in this country is that it is very much circular. We go back to the same arguments over and over again. You know, um, the monuments didn't always exist. And they didn't exist in the old antebellum South with the plantations around. They didn't exist at all. So it takes about 20 to 50 years for most of these monuments to come up. And even during that time, which is also an untold story, you had black radicals and progressives fighting against these things being put up. Uh, people, people like Ottawa Wells, I mean, way back in like the 1910s, who literally said, this is just not right. You can't do this to people. You can't like put a terrorist object in a neighborhood that's designed to intimidate us. So we were always fighting these battles. And I think that while this is a good step towards change, I think that there's some complicating factors in it. Um, it might have been Leonard Pitts, the uh, journalist from, from uh, Florida, who said he actually liked the monuments where they were. Now, I don't agree with this opinion, please. But this is what he said. He said, look, you're driving through the South and you get to a small town, like look around in Oxford, and there's one here. You get to the town square and you see in the town square a 27 foot tall statue of some white guy with his arms crossed facing north, you know, like that. He said that those sort of things is almost like if you were in a war 
and you were getting ready to go into a minefield, there's a big sign that says, watch out. Your mind's here. It's the same concept. When I go places, I look for signs. Most black people look for signs. I mean, you literally used to have the signs where, you know, it said this was a sundown town. Black folks can't sleep in this city, in this town. You have to go to the next town over, right? So in one sense, removing these symbols may be dangerous in that we don't know what's really in the town. But secondarily, and back to my earlier point, just getting rid of the monuments is not the solution. You have to go to solutions that are deeper than that. People should understand why they're going down. You know, if you're going to take down, um, like in my hometown, the first one to go down way back in 2017, actually it was the third one to go down. It was the Robert E. Lee. It was like a 70 foot tall, gigantic, in the middle of one of the major parts of our pretty area, the Garden District. And if I asked the average person, you know, who was Robert E. Lee? They would have no idea. They would say he was, he was a general, you know, he fought in the war, you know. He didn't even visit New Orleans. Why is there a statue to him in my hometown? It makes no sense whatsoever. So I just think that, again, it's a step in the right direction, but sometimes when you force a change without people understanding, it's like with a child. You know, if I don't think that a parent should hit their children at all. But if you're going to punish a child by putting them into the corner or putting the dunce cap on their head, something like that, if you don't explain to the child why you're you know, taking, taking their video game away for a while, you know, they won't understand what needs to change. You have to explain the behavior. You have to ask them whether they, whether they understand the behavior. Then you have to see, do you understand it? Do you, do, you, do you now disagree with it, right? So once you get those things sorted out, then the child can say, I totally get it now. This won't happen. But just like tearing things down, it's, it's not quite enough. It's a portion of the solution. Yeah. I never thought about the fact that having them up actually is a way to protect yourself. That's interesting. That That is a totally different um, kind of take on that. You know, it's scary because it's so right. And yeah. look, I'll tell you, there's a park where I live at New Orleans in, in the main park, public park, and there's these mansions that surround the entire park, like sort of rim the entire park. I remember running down past one of the mansions when they had looked over the side, and we have Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And right. one of the crews, one of the parade organizations is called Rex. And the riders in Rex, by their rules, are like 99.5% white. They let in one black guy like 10 years ago. But their costumes are these hoods that look almost identical to Klansman hoods. And so on this mansion, in this park, on the back door facing the greens, was a hooded figure. And I'm thinking, all right, so that's a Rex dude. So if I meet this dude one day, I know exactly what he's all about. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Um, as a writer, your words are your clay, your paint, and your instrument. What do you think of the term and the words people of color? Do they create solidarity or do they align the differences in how the legacy of slavery and quote white lash affect blacks in comparison to other people? Yeah. And, you know, this is something where I actually changed my personal feelings on it because, okay. you know, look, black people have been called various things over time. And we have moved from, you know, Negro to black, African-American, and you can name a few others between. And color. Example. And color. Can't forget that one, right? Mm. And I remember like in the maybe early 2000s when I began to hear people like really saying people of color a lot. I kept thinking, OK, it's the next one, you know, we're not doing African-American anymore. OK, fine, right? And then I listened to a lot of these thinkers who kept saying it does a lot of the difference. Language is just for a reason. I am a writer. To me, words are very important. It's the reason why I love George Orwell, 1984, where he talks about using news, news speak to gloss over the truth of, of the other matter. Um, I don't think that people of color is propaganda per se that's designed to cause more damage than, than, to, than to be helpful. But I do think it is important to note that there are differences in the way that uh, history has treated Black folks in America, and how it treats us today. And I think that, you know, look, I have friends of every race imaginable. You know, Asian America, Latinx, indigenous people, you know, they're all my buddies and friends, right? But we have different experiences. You know, if I talk to a Jewish brother about his ancestors, what happened to them over in Germany or in Europe, it's a different experience. If I ask my Native American brothers and sisters, you know, what was it like for, like, your ancestors here, you know, during the Trail of Tears or other things during that period of time? They have their own story. And so I think... At this moment, for me, I think that maybe it's most effective to say black and people of color. I've seen the acronym that's, that they're trying to try, which is BIPOC, so BIPOC. I'm not so sure about that yet. But I just think that, you know, particularly in this moment, particularly in the moment 
where we've had so much of the racist underbelly of America becoming like the main story. You know, you got those dudes with the tiki torches marching in Charlottesville. We have a president who couldn't condemn them. We have, you know, frankly, like a conservative party that at one time you could argue, like, had like actual like uh, ideological ideas, which is now just pandering towards racism. The idea that the American president would literally say on camera, I think last week, you know, if I'm reelected, I'm going to make sure that black people, or what he said, poor people, Low-income people can't get into your neighborhoods in the suburbs. Yeah, you know that's barely coded language, because white supremacy made sure that black black people couldn't get loans, couldn't get the GI Bill to get houses, and on and on and on. And so I think in a time when anti-black racism is so obvious, you have to be specific about what we as African Americans are experiencing in this moment, because otherwise it's creating cover and it's allowing them to sort of say, "Oh, you know, people of color are doing pretty well in this country." Well, look. My Asian brothers and sisters, you know, doing this is very much Vietnamese. We have like the second largest Vietnamese population in America. They're doing pretty well as a, as a people. And I love that for them, right? But you have to factor in how we treat people. If I go into a bank versus my, my white buddy, um, goes to a bank, different experience. You know, if I go to a bank versus my Vietnamese sister, different experience. And so because it is always there every single moment, because it's such a part of who we are as a, as a, as a, as a country, um, I would direct our attention to a lawsuit from the early 1900s, I think it was, where um, I think it was a Chinese American petitioned the Supreme Court to be called white because he recognized that if he was labeled as something other than white, he was on the wrong side of the economic battle. He needed to be able to start a business, to have a safe life. And so he says, I'm not one of them, I'm one of you. And that's a big part of our history. Even the, even the fact that, you know, in 1900, if you were Italian-American, you were not white. If you were Irish-American, you were not white. They called you all kinds of, all those terms I won't say, you know, in public. Right. They right. called you those terms. And so they fought over generations to become white. And because of this whole branding of the, of the dark skin, they made it. We can't make it. We have to destroy this system in order to be free, to be liberated of what's designed to oppress us. So are you familiar with the, the, the Indoc, which is African descendants of slaves? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so there's been a lot of like Twitter conversation about um, the usage of ADOS too. Um, so, yeah. Um, the narrator thinks about how humor, anger, and questions, or, or questions are the the best responses for be, to being black in America cast system. The narrator's human, I mean, humor is often deadpan. For example, I like my job is so black, the police planted evidence on it. <laughs> Personally, which tactic do you use most often and why? You know, first of all, being from New Orleans, I think one of the sort of untold stories about us is that humor is such a part of who we are as a city. Um, you know, Mardi Gras is often satirical. A lot of like the small parades had like all these floats with these sort of satirical humorous uh, themes that are attached to them. Um, you know, there's a certain kind of humor, I think, in New Orleans amongst black folks that is related to like a little bit of fatalism, but it's also related to empowerment. It's like, you know what, you can't destroy us. You can try. We're gonna make fun of you for trying to destroy us. Yes. So a lot of those feelings are part of how I approach the world. And I think that, um, you know, like for me with this book in particular, I, I like, I've written a lot of essays, like, for example, one you mentioned earlier on Lit Hub, which was just, like, straightforward, no humor whatsoever. Just, like, to me, it was, like, just, like, a, I'm, I'm a human thunderstorm, like, coming across, you know, the prairie to show you what's really going on, like, to rain down upon you. But I thought in my book, um, if it was too dark, first of all, I wouldn't enjoy writing, writing it. Um, I'll tell you that in the early draft of the book, in the first chapter, it was so dark that when I read it out loud to some friends at an event, they started crying. I kept thinking, I don't want like people to like be crying <laughs> like in the first 10 pages of my book, basically, right? And I think that for my character, because he is in somewhat in, the, in denial and somewhat working against his own beliefs, he has to justify by being sort of blase, blase about a lot of things that are going on. And so I think that in my own life, you know, I've used that as well. You know, I've used all the things, you know, car compartmentalization. I've been direct. I've used dry wit. Um, I think that it's important to have a grab bag of, of responses to what we see in our lives. And I think that um, 
you know, if, as a writer who reads a lot, I enjoy reading people who can sort of navigate those different sort of shades within their writing. You know, nothing makes me smile bigger than, than a Toni Morrison joke in her books because she is like so firm and so like yes. solid. Right. But then, like with a joke, you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't see that coming. It like just hits you so hard. So, so you know, I think my style is one that often incorporates humor, and often it's because. Uh, I was on a panel with some women. It was all, all women and me on the panel. And one of them said, you know, she's a romance writer and few things are less like taken seriously than romance. People are like, you know, I can't read that as a serious book. And I, I remember thinking, I said out loud, you know, what's about race or like that? People are like, give me some Brussels sprouts first, you know, because it's so dry mm -hmm. and whatever. And so I just think that for me, I want to bring different shades to it and it makes it more interesting and provocative and entertaining. And you know, I probably shouldn't say his name, but you know Kanye West is a master of that. Now I took points from him because he was somebody who would say the craziest things in a humorous way. You kind of go, that dude is, oh my goodness, but that is funny as heck. Yeah. And, you know he's in he's in the same tradition as people like uh, Chris Rock and Dick Gregory and many others, and I think it's a wonderful thing. It's funny you mentioned Dick Gregory. Um, I represent his estate, and we're working on yeah, we're working on some really cool books. Um, and just going through his life and all the things that he was able to kind of get across in in a witty and comedic way, you like listen, and then you have you go deeper. You're like, oh my god, he just like he just landed something, and it really makes you kind of um, process in a different way. So when it's coming to this humor thing, um, there's a scene with the narrator in the waiting room of the de demelanization clinic, right? And he's reading his device, and up pops these ads for books like with the titles like, Mommy, Why Is My Skin So Dark? Or Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Mm -hmm. And Lakeisha's First Perm, <laughs> uh, Dilution Anxiety and the Black Phallus, Black Past, White Future, Keep Your Child Out of the Sun. I Let me tell you, I had so many thoughts when reading this passage. Um, first of all, because I'm like very paranoid about being tracked. And in my own experiences, like sometimes when I like am on my phone and I'm seeing things pop up, I'm like, oh my God, they are like totally watching and, and hearing everything that I say. So I was thinking about that. And then I was thinking about the book titles and how they come to be just in general in the publishing industry. How do book titles come to be, including your own? Um, so how did you come up with the title? Um, and who is the we in Casting the Shadow? Yeah, so first of all, in, in that scene in the clinic when, he, when the ads pop up, half of those titles are real titles. Half I've made up myself. So that should say a lot, right? Yes. In, in some way, they're kind of all like either mildly or overtly anti-black. So yeah, that. Um, then with the title, it's funny you asked that question now because I just said his name. Part of it came from Kanye West, and I'll just say it up front. The wow. Earlier... So, so when I was in, in at the midpoint of writing this book, I submitted uh, the opening chapter to a contest and won that contest. It was like a novel in progress, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can even go online and see 2014, Maurice Burfman wins a contest. And the name of that book at the time was All of the Lights, which is a Kanye West song on Dark Fantasy, right? So, so I was like, yeah, you know, th this, this title makes sense. I'm going to keep this title because this is really a book about a parent who wants to make sure that his child is able to see all the lights, like the lights being like the American project, you know, economic prosperity, you know, personal freedom, you know, the sky's the limit, that sort of feeling. And as I got through it, I had like reservations. One reservation was, well, first of all, I didn't put like a lot of metaphors about lights in the book. I kept thinking I was gonna like put some metaphors about like light into the book itself. It's not really there so much. And then second, I didn't want like Kanye West like finding me like on Twitter or like, <laughs> Author, I don't know this dude put my title on his book cover, so there was help that whole thing. And then I just said, well, like, what if we flipped it around instead of all the lights? Uh, let's see, lights, uh, darkness, shadows. Yeah, shadows. That, that would kind of look good. It's like, well, you know, what about shadows? Well, it needs to be like active, like, like an active verb type thing. So let's see, casting of shadows. Um, the shadows we cast. Like one of my personal buddies was the editor was like, yeah, the shadows we cast. That's pretty hot. Like, nah, it's too passive. I said. You cast a shadow like the narrator, right? It's like, uh, not quite. And I thought we, and the reason why it's we is because the great trick of a society that's built upon white supremacy is that it makes us all complicit in it. So that yes. 
Like, let's, let's say, like, you're the ultimate black supporter who's not a black person. I'll uh, say her name, Rachel, right? Like, she was so pro black that she made herself black. Oh, you know, much that's of, right. Much of the consternation of so many of us, right? But even she is becoming complicit in these, like, in black things, basically, right? So she, in trying to help, caused more damage. And, you know, if you're an overt racist, obviously you're casting a shadow. If you're a father who's trying to erase your own son's blackness to protect him, you're casting a shadow. And so the point is that this is built to make us all part of it, because if you're a part of the system, you don't want to oppose the system. It makes us all shameful and guilty about this thing that we're participating in. And so, you know, I just thought that it was a title that fit the project and it fit the truth of our story in America. It's so funny because when it comes to the titles, there's there's lots of, oftentimes lots of conversation about what's going to work. Like you said, oh, that's too passive. Um, oh, that's a commercial title. Um, does it fit the genre? There's from a publishing perspective, there's so many thoughts about it. But oftentimes, the title that that the author initially came up with, it's the way to go. And yeah. so I'm I'm excited that they that they were they allowed you to keep the title. Yeah. They were great. They were, they loved it. They they didn't they never just they, they wanted no changes. They were like, we're gonna put this on the cover. It's done deal. Nice, nice. So your novel has been called speculative family drama, reality horror, and a dystopian satire. Yet in light of how 2020 has unfolded so far, it could easily be considered current affairs <laughs> or ripped straight from the headlines. How do you feel about these genre labels applied to your novel? Is your book still in the dystopian category or is it now seen as straight literary fiction? Did categorization have an effect at all on how the publisher positioned the book um, when they were trying to sell it? And um, well, let me just start there because I have a whole bunch of other questions tied to that. Well, I, I'll tell you, it gives me pleasure that the book is hard to categorize. Because um, I consider myself to be sort of like a chameleon, chameleon, you know, I've been a lawyer, I've owned a restaurant, you know, I'm a runner, I'm a bodybuilder, I'm all these different things, you know. And it, just, it was funny because as the first year of the book being out passed, like every month I'd see a review, like a new tag. Like first it was like, it's dystopian. And then, no, 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 it's like this straight up lit. No, 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 this is a horror. And I'm like, wow, it's horror too? And it's bad. <laughs> um, but I will say that there's a, there's a sort of perverse pleasure in like basically like seeing my book shift from like being dystopian to being basically like true to fact, you know? Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that I actually took a technique from Margaret Atwood in The Handmaid Tale, okay. where you know, that's the book where this woman is like, you know, she is imprisoned, she has no control of her reproductive rights, um, she can't escape, you know, she has to wear certain clothing, they've stolen her name from her. In that book, Margaret Atwood wrote it like in the early 80s. She said that she made it a point to never have a thing in that book that hadn't happened somewhere in the world already. So if you went to like someplace in Europe where they made women like take their husband's like a chosen name, like even if their first name got lost, if you went to someplace in Africa where people were, were forced to wear certain you know clothing like veils or in, in, um, in the Middle East. Um, so she was just using reality. And I did the exact same thing. I just looked throughout history, throughout the world and said, yeah, you have had fenced in ghettos, not only in Germany, but in Italy and other places all around the world, including in America. And I just kept doing that same, same thing over and over again. Even the technology of like changing somebody's skin color, those things exist. I mean, we can make um, glow in the dark weasels now. We can make, you know, squids that can actually like shoot out different colored ink now. We can do all sorts of things with genetics now. So why not have a society in which, okay, you're saying that being black is bad, but we're going to. We're gonna um, give you the tech to change that whenever you want to with the drop of a hat, basically. So those things are all a part of the experience. And I'll say, my my publishers actually did a fantastic job because I heard so many horror stories um, from acquaintances rollouts, from like people saying, just change the entire concept, you know, change the main character. You know, kids, they tell us this famous story about like his black protagonist and long division being, they're saying, Make it two white girls, so like a black protagonist. In fact, take them out of Mississippi and put them up in like New York, you know, that sort of thing. I've seen people's titles get changed. Yeah. I've seen, you know, covers that don't fit the actual narrative. And my publishers at One World and my editors, um, Victory Matsui, Chris Jackson, and Nicole Counts, 
they were always very strategic at staying true to the work itself. And uh, even marketing, you know, marketing goes like all kinds of ways. And I actually liked the fact that on the back cover, they were, they were comparing the book to Invisible Man, to uh, Get Out the Film. Um, and it's like, just keep it within that space because that's, you know, that's my people. I love those movies and books. So to me, it fit perfectly. And I think that, you know, the only limitation on how many copies are sold and sold very, very well is that, well, people often kind of don't want to think about race because it's such a hard topic. And you don't want to feel that sort of, you know, accusatory tone of, well, look, look what you're doing. You know, you're casting a shadow again, right? So, but I have found that in this um, post-George Floyd era, you know, sales skyrocket. The people are like, they want to know. They want to know things. And that's why you're seeing even older books like Between the World and Me come back yes. to the forefront. So, so was, was it very was it difficult? I mean, you found the best editors. I mean, Nicole and Victory and, and Chris, I mean, some of the best in the business. Um, was it hard to find the right publisher? Um, was that process difficult? And um, how did your agent kind of position the book when she was pitching it? He or she was pitching it. Um, did they pitch it as a satirical novel? I and mean, the reason I'm asking is because I'm working with an author right now who has a satirical novel. And it's like, okay, how do we kind of approach this process? So I'd be interested to hear what you, how, how you all went about it. Well, first of all, I will say that in my personal research, satire is always a hard sell for people who are not white. What I mean by that is some of the biggest selling canonical books of all time, some of my favorites, like Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut or um, Cash 22 by Joseph Heller. And these books are classics of American literature. And the reason why is that I think that people are more willing to accept that tone towards like race as a topic. I mean, not race, you know, war is a topic, right? When it comes to race, we get real skittery. People like, I've heard like from a lot of like white readers, I didn't know if I should laugh at this, but I did. Okay, mission accomplished. Great, right? I think that, like, some writers, like, I mean, one of the most brilliant writers I know is Percival Everett. In his books, the satire, when he does satire, is so cutting. You almost can't even, like, tell whether it's a joke or not, because it's just so... Right. And I think that if there wasn't this prejudice against black writers, he'd have a bigger audience than he does have. He's so many books over the years, but I think he should be, like, a superstar of, of the world. He's a mentor to my mentors, which is why I love him so much. I think... Paul Beatty does satire in the cellar, you know, right? And I think he's one of the rare ones who does it like straight up and people will recognize it kind of go, yes, this is exactly what we need, right? I think that I made a conscious choice to not be like straight satire. The book has a lot of heart. You know, my narrator does care about his child, his wife, and there's like a lot of heartfelt conversations, a lot of pain being felt that are like, you know, true to their experiences. Um, my agent, PJ Mark is one of the greatest agents in the world. He represents Kiese and Robert Jones, aka Son of Baldwin, and many others in the industry, um, who are just fantastic writers. And he shepherded me to different to different um, um, publishers. We had different meetings, um, and it's funny when we went to One World. He basically said, because he sort of like knew how people were going to respond different different publishers. He's like, you know, so and so is going to say this, you know, so and so is going to talk too much. He says, you go to One World, it's going to be a conversation. I'm just going to hang back. He, he didn't say a word almost in the meeting, my agent. He just said, I want y'all to talk to each other. And in that process of sitting in that room that day, um, 2017, with Victory and Chris Jackson, I had found my home. Now, I didn't know if I was going to sign with them yet, but I was like, they get it. They understand me. They actually had more confidence in my concept than I had. They were like, yo, this is it. We're going to roll with it. They didn't say like what category they see in this being in, other than to say, they saw it as a radically black piece of fiction designed to attack racism and designed to make people feel uncomfortable about their position when it comes to race. And I was like, that's it. You're right. Let's do this thing. And we about two weeks later, we signed up. That's it. To, um, it's funny because you know, I said you had found your people. You know, it, it, it speaks to the idea of what it, how important it is to have black people and people of color and people diverse editors inside a publishing house because there's something about feeling like you have found your quote tribe that's going to help really usher your book out into the world um so you know love chris have known him for years um you couldn't have had a better a better editor 
Um, a quick, quick footnote to that. I remember one of the places I won't name them and embarrass them. But one of the editors at the different at a different place was like, you know, you should make this book about half the size it is right now and make it straight comedy, and not even like satire, just like make it a joke. And I remember being like, wow. you just totally missed the point. Yeah. Well, since your novel has been called speculative, let's speculate. Okay, so in your Lit Hub piece, you describe the election of our current president as America's new ice age. How do you think the lives of black and brown people will look in four years if he is reelected? Oh, well, I mean, what can I say? So if he comes back, I think he will feel he will feel emboldened. And because every representative, you know, whether it's the president, governor, whether it's city council, even police officers, each one of those people represent a constituency. And so if he becomes our president again, which means that he got more than 50% of the electoral college, that means that half of the country will feel on some level that he is correcting his vision and correcting his actions. And so the things that he's done over the past few years, you know, that, that went from like being questionable to being overtly racist will become consist, you know, consistently overtly racist. Um, and I think that people were like, let's just hold, hold our fire for now on his side. They will feel unleashed. You know, they will, if they're planning a tax, they're going to do it. If they plan on passing some bills, they're going to do it. If they're planning on, like, they're stealing things, they're going to do these things because they feel like they are protected and covered by his presence. And so, you know, when I think about him, I think about an American future because every president has a long coattail. And so even if he is out, like, after four years, there's, like, somebody more liberal that comes in after him, He's opened this Pandora's box. Um, there was a commentator I heard the other day, or actually a white guy from Mississippi, he was on the radio talking about how, like, he, he thinks, and I'll say his name, but he thinks that Trump is basically our George Wallace. He's that guy who's going to say as much directly to your face, because he knows that it's going to excite his base enough. And what's really scary about it is that George Wallace had an upper ceiling on how popular he could be. You know, the reason why he's not president is because um, Atwater and others ran against him and, he, and they were more popular than he was. Um, not Atwater. Um, oh, crap. I can't right now. Um, but it's in the 50s and 60s. So, so my point is, Trump has proven that he can be that popular. He can actually win the biggest crown in the world and reshape the world in his vision. We're to the point now where people don't even care that 150,000 Americans have already died. Now we hit and the reason why, in my opinion, is because the maintenance of the caste system, the maintenance of white supremacy, is literally more important than the lives and health of white folks in America. I think in a lot of their minds, they'll take a few L's in the short term, they use like the, the kids' terminology, to maintain this system that has provided their lives, that allowed their grandfathers to get the houses back you know, in, in the World War II era and pass on that wealth to the kids and to the grandkids. That's really important. It's more important than being good in the moment. Well, it's interesting to me that because the, the, um, the black and brown communities are being decimated by this pandemic. The stock market is making more billionaires and making them richer. So it's, it's, it's right on point. Um, Neuroscientists have been studying how humans are hardwired for hate and distrust of those who are different, but they're also saying that we're hardwired for love, altruism, compassion, and receptivity to what's different. So do you think racism is a result of our most primitive instincts, or is it a learned behavior and one that the son Nigel in your novel is struggling with? I think it's a complex thing. First of all, I say, we probably need some aliens to attack Earth, like Independence Day, because with a shared enemy, we would be more likely like, to see the love amongst ourselves as a, as a single race of people, right? Because race is a construct, it's a social construct, it's not a genetic construct. I think that while people are hardwired to have a certain tribalism to themselves, even as young as like three years old by some tales, I think we can overcome that. And I think it takes a willingness, I think it takes imagination, I think it's gonna take efforts that we have not tried in history. I think that because America's greatest strength is diversity, we are the most um, heterogeneous country in the history of the world. You know, we're not like Japan, we're like 95% Japanese, or like Italy, we're mostly 
it's Italian. There's some countries where if you move there, you can never become a citizen of that country. This country is designed for all humanity. This country is designed for everybody to live their dreams, except that's not entirely true. And so until we can accept the fact that we have these visions of a future that we can't achieve, we have to sort of change courses to find that truth. We can't stop the tribalism. And so you know, somebody who read my book said that they saw Nigel and Araminta as two characters who found a sort of radical black liberation. They said that in their moment, they couldn't solve all the problems, but they can get free for a while. I think for some of us, that's, that's the best you can do. I think it's not a long-term solution. I think that we have to get to a place, and this, this really falls on white people because black people are not supporting racism. We are not producing racism. It doesn't benefit us. When it comes down to it, it is a white produced system designed to benefit white people. And so what that means is that while I'm here to like write my books, and while there are a lot of black activists who are saying the truth and putting the story out there about what's really going on, it comes down to white folks making some choices that are going to be very, very hard for themselves. Saying, you know, I'm a white progressive in a small town where my kid's school is 98% black. And there's a school across town with no resources. That's 90, their, their school is 90% white and the other school is 90% white, uh, black. If you as a parent who is white can see that having your kid in an all white school is a bad thing in the long term, you can make some changes to integrate. That's a hard choice that has some really good effects. And the fact that we have Brown versus the Board of Education, we have um, various laws passed to ensure diversity in schools that have been ignored over 50 years or 60 years. Today, we are as segregated in our schools as we were in 1968. And so that kind of tells the entire story. And so we have to fight at every level. It's like that Churchill speech. We're going to fight them on the shores, fight them in the houses, fight them on the you know, fight them in the desert. We're gonna fight it everywhere. And until that mentality maintains, we're gonna be going in the wrong direction. And I think that that is what long-term destroys the American empire. We can't figure this out. We're not here in like a hundred years. Wow. You know, I have so many more questions for you, um, but we're kind of running out of time. But I, I am gonna ask one more question. Um, so at one point, Nigel draws a comic book, a talent his father doesn't appreciate or encourage. When you were a boy, did you dabble in any creative endeavors and were you encouraged by your parents to explore them? Oh my goodness, that's a new question. I've never heard that before. Yes, uh, I, I did a lot of things. I mean, first of all, uh, I was that nerdy kid who played violin like in fifth grade. So my, my little like miniature child-sized violin I played you know, Suzuki lessons, learn how to play the violin. I was a big kid. As I got bigger, I moved to spring bass. And I played that uh, throughout my high school years. And I really enjoyed it. Playing music with um, not coincidentally a very diverse group. You know, in New Orleans, we're majority black, maybe 40% white, and, you know, the rest are Vietnamese people. In that group, it was all of us, including some Latinos as well. Um, so it was a wonderful experience. Um, I also um, enjoyed drawing. I was pretty good at that. And more than anything else, I enjoyed reading. And I have to say, my parents were always supportive. You know, they didn't finish college, but my dad went for a minute. My mom did business college for a little while. Um, but they fed my thirst for literature and reading. And one of my fondest memories, I, I get kind of uh, choked up thinking about it. I remember one day, my dad was a car salesman. He made a lot of money. He was very successful selling cars. He made like you know, six figures in the 80s selling cars, right? And he would always like, he would like just treat us to things constantly. And I remember this is back in the days when we had traveling salesmen. We would get like people like selling vacuum cleaners and knife sets coming to our doors. Yes, and one day yes. somebody came to the door selling um, encyclopedias. And I didn't like pay attention. I'm like, oh, it's like, they'll never get that. It was like 600 bucks for a set. And they bought it on the spot. And we, we had no bookcase in the house. We, we, we didn't read a lot of books in the house at that time. I'm like 10 years old. I had this, you know, 45 book set of encyclopedia, uh, World Book Encyclopedia, and I am not exaggerating. I read every single page, every single book in that 45 book set over the course of like a year and a half. I mean, I, I was a sponge. I learned so much, and that's what my parents did for me. They made sure that I was fed intellectually at every single turn. And 
I'm lucky in that, you know, I had two loving parents who were not in prison, hadn't been killed, weren't being destroyed at their jobs, had decent health care, and had a vision for me. And that, you know, they were able to provide me some, some of the best opportunities in my own life. But I understand that, you know, that is a, a rare story in this country that's designed to take parents out at the knees. And so, um, you know, I hit the jackpot. You know, I had great parents who avoided the worst that America has to offer, and here I am today. And as we are we are enjoying your, we are enjoying your career. We can't wait till the next books come out. And like I said, I could honestly, I have so many questions for you. I could talk to you forever. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maurice, for um, doing this. Uh, we're really excited. It's going to be a fabulous talk, and when people listen to it, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And I will say this. My next book comes out in exactly one year. It's a book of short stories called um, The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You. Right now, I'm writing my third book. I'm, I'm here in Oxford working on that. And I meant to say this at the outset. I love your hair, Regina. It is the bomb. It's beautiful. I love the colors, the yellow. I love your smile. Thank you for being a part of this. I really feel like I was in a, a very safe space. But thank you for being a part of this opportunity. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank AWP for allowing us to, to do this. <laughs>